be to have people uh, have a video on or off as you prefer. Uh, but I thought I'd just, uh, by way of introduction, tell you a little bit about myself and what I'm planning to do. And then I, I, if you're okay with it, I would like everybody to just uh, unmute and just tell me one quick line about what you do and what you'd like to, uh, how you'd better like to communicate data. Uh, it's a little uh, last minute for me to uh, tailor things to that, but it, it would help to keep that in mind. So, you know, are you looking at better academic writing or are you looking at writing for a lay audience? Uh, or are you writing research papers that you would then like to communicate better with a lay audience? I'd love to know one line about, um, you know, your communication goals. So just to tell you a little bit about myself, as Japneet said, I've been a journalist for a while and I've been focusing on data for the last 10 years or so. I live in uh, Chennai and I work independently. Um, I would say I'm sort of in the process of moving from data journalism alone to data communication more broadly. And that's something I hope to be able to talk more about in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, I want to start by uh, saying I love disclaimers always in a data set. I love looking for the little asterisk and seeing, uh, uh, you know, I feel like there's a lot of, lot always there. I love the openness and the, um, uh, the, the absence of fake certainty that disclaimers carry. So let me start with a disclaimer, which is that I am not trained in math, stats, economics, politics, anything particularly useful. Uh, all of my familiarity with numbers is familiarity rather than knowledge. So it has come uh, from having uh, worked closely with large Indian data sets over the last 10 years. And um, I would like to say that particularly for those of you who are already working in the social sciences, you're starting with, uh, with a level of familiarity and knowledge about Indian data that, um, that I don't have, that I've sort of pieced together. So I do want to say that um, uh, while I have over the years picked up some uh, tips and knowledge about better analyzing and communicating data, particularly for a lay audience. This will not be very technical and it will not be technically advanced, particularly for those of you already working in the field. So that's my uh, disclaimer. Uh, I, uh, you know, all through my time working in Indian newsrooms, the focus very much was on communicating with a lay audience, not just a lay audience, but an audience that often uh, was either scared of numbers or uninterested in numbers or whose attention we felt we had to draw into numbers. But uh, increasingly, I am talk trying to talk more to uh, student and academic uh, audiences as well. So I'd also be happy to talk about ways to better communicate with uh, non lay audiences. Um, so yeah, if, if you don't mind, if people could just go around and tell me just one line about yourself as well as your communication uh, goals that that would be great. Please feel free to just unmute and tell me a line about yourself. And maybe what you could do is when you're done, when the first person is done, just say the next person's name. So then it will be like the chain games we used to play in uh, recess time. <laughs> Should I, uh, let me start. Uh, since Pratik is my first window, I'm going to say Pratik. Uh, hello, Rukmini. It's great to have you. Uh, so I am an incoming student uh, in PhD at uh, Sociology Department in Emory University in the US. Uh, so I have uh, had a, a background of uh, interdisciplinary social sciences in not any particular discipline, but uh, political science, law and governance. And like, uh, but most of it, I have been uh, working in uh, the domain of theory, right? Uh, political theory, social theory. And now that I'm going to the US, uh, one of the reasons is that I wanted to uh, get familiar with uh, uh, so like social sciences, uh, the, the way it is done in the US, uh, quantitative uh, and statistical base. So I personally, I do not have any uh, background in uh, data as such. So this is just my, I'm just uh, here to learn. Okay, thanks. Okay. I, I would say Asad is, I can see him. So, uh, Asad. Hi. So, I'm Asad Tarek. I'm a second year PhD student at uh, IIT Delhi uh, in economics. Uh, I work in the area of political economy of development and religion. And uh, through this, I would uh, what I would like to learn is how to uh, popularize my research for a wider audience in, in the form of news articles, etc. 
Uh, Hi, uh, so uh, sorry, I, I, I cannot uh, open my video because of no worries. In remote area. Uh, behind. So I'm Kishan. I'm an incoming PhD student at Northeastern University, Boston. And I write regularly for uh, NewsClick. Uh, I do some, some kind of data analysis. And I'm looking like I'm looking to learn about. So I wrote something about public finance and uh, fiscal policy. And I got multiple rejection from Indian Express and uh, the Mint. And I want to know like uh, why this got rejected because it's like it's a new idea. It's a completely new thing, but why it's got rejected like, multiple times. So this I'm looking for. Thank you. Okay, on that specifically, if you want at the after the workshop, you can I'll give you my email address and you could I could write back with some feedback if you like. Uh, Kishan, thank do you, you want to you pass? So no, no problem. Yeah. Do you want to pass to the next person? Uh, sorry, Vinaykan. Hi, I'm Vinaykan. I'm from Kerala. Um, so I, I graduated last year. Um, currently planning to join a master's program in Italy uh, in economics and public policy. Uh, I'm also interested in public policy and like uh, to communicate with people. I'm finding it difficult to communicate with data. And I'm a student of Austrian economics. I like Austrian economics a lot where theory has been dealt with. And like I'm advised to use more empirics into my writing. So yeah, I'm glad to do that. Thank you. Would you pass to Vinaykan? Uh, hi, hi everybody. Um, my name is Fiza and I am a research associate at ISI Delhi. I think I uh, feel that I am sort of comfortable with academic writing and uh, research papers, but uh, I would want to write more to reach the wider audience and specifically in other languages also. So I think that's something I want to learn. Thanks. Would uh, you pass to Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kavit, Kavitab, you want? Hello, everyone. This is Kavitab. So I did my MPhil from University of Hyderabad. Uh, basically, collected. Uh, pr uh, I did a primary data survey, and I don't have too much idea about the secondary data. I want to work on uh, uh, out of pocket uh, expenditure. So I came this here to join uh, to learn the data or the secondary data. Hello. Thank yeah. you. We can, uh, we can again, you specifically on that, uh, specifically on that, Kavita, please email me after this because we've been doing some yes. work on out of pocket expenditure. So there yes. are a couple of data sources that come to mind immediately. So I'd be happy to share yes. that with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, do you want to pass to the next person? Uh, go in. I could. Uh, okay. Did, I think he said Govindapura. Can you, Govindapura? Suresh. Oh, Suresh. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, Suresh, I sorry. just heard Govind. <laughs> I'm just checking if there any other Govind in the <laughs> call. So, sorry. My name is Suresh. Uh, I just passed out from IIT Tirupati uh, with PhD in economics. Uh, now, currently, I joined, like the last month, I joined in uh, this Kriya University in business school, IFMR business school. So, basically, I'm interested in uh, most of the qualitative studies. So, due to uh, the COVID, COVID and all those things, I have to use uh, only secondary data for my PhD. So I'm interested in learning more about the data aspects. Thank you. Can yeah, you pass to you. someone else? Oh, uh, I think Saurabh. Saurabh Anand. Hi, I am Saurabh. I completed my master's from DSC and I am new in research field. So I just uh, want to know and uh, start um, in this in this field my career in this field okay could you name someone else to go next 
Philips. I didn't get that, Saurabh, sorry. Rohit, Rohit. Rohit. Hi, everyone. My name is Rohit. I am a PhD student at Ashoka University. So I work with a lot of economic history, archival data. So I think my goal is we often don't get what we are looking for. So, you know, try to be able to communicate whatever best we can about the data, given the limited amount of data that we have, say, on migration, on birthplace, et cetera. So I really admired your talks with uh, Dr. Sinmay Tumbe and the recent set of CASI talks. So it's been, I think, quite illuminating. Try to work with whatever limited data that we have. And that's my goal. Try to learn how to do that. I will pass to Shravan. Hi, I'm Shravan. I'm currently working as research associate in CSC APU. And as a part of the work, like State of Working India, we were using uh, most of the secondary data resources like NFHS, PLFS. So I'm very interested uh, in this session. And also, I was reading your book, The Whole Numbers and Half Truths, and it was very insightful for me. So I think this session will add up to more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you name someone else? Venkatesh, did Venkatesh speak? No, not yet, I think. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to read Venkatesh's message out. He's working as an RA for Development Research Organization in Delhi, and he wants to learn how some now outdated publicly available data sets are reliable. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask Mehraj next. Mehraj, are you able to hear? and unmute. Okay, maybe I can ask Shabnam and then we can come back to Maharaj when he... Oh yes, okay, we have another text. Uh, yes, uh, sure. Shabnam, until then, would you like to unmute and uh, introduce yourself? Yeah. yeah, thank you, I'm Shabnam and I'm a second year PhD student at IIT Delhi. So somewhat I'm comfortable with academic and research writing, but I would prefer writing for a larger audience so that I can convey my message more simply and clearly. So I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Could you name the next person? Naveen Kumar. Hi, am I audible? Yes. Hi, I'm Naveen. Uh, I'm a third year PhD candidate at Delhi School Economics. I work in the area of environmental microeconomics and environmental development, particularly. And uh, this workshop will help me to write for general audience and whatever I have done my research through opaque something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll just call upon the next few people so we have everyone covered. Uh, Shubham. Hi, hi, Rukmini. Hi. Uh, so I I have a master's degree from Madras School of Economics. Uh, I currently work in a corporate firm, so I'm not uh, into social science, but I really liked your book and I have re I have listened to your podcasts on like various podcasts. So I I'm just trying to learn from you and wanting to know how you do it. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Harchan. Sorry. Okay. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 you name you name. Okay. The Harchan Ram, please. Hello, it's a great pleasure to uh, see you in this platform. My name is Harchand and I'm working as a research analyst at the International Institute for Population Sciences, Mumbai. I obtained my PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, last year. And I'm working, my PhD was about uh, economics of aging. And currently we are working on children development scores and development index like this one only. So thank you. Thank you. So I think that only leaves Aditi and uh, uh, Mehraj text. I think that leaves only Aditi. Aditi and Sana. Sana is also there. Aditi. Oh, okay. Okay. 
Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sana. Hello everyone. I'm Sana. Sana is short. I'm in my final semester of MCOM Applied Economics, and and uh, since my subject is not purely economics, I have the uh, I have econometrics, econometrics in last semester, so I, I've just gotten into that analysis. So I'm just curious to see in this data workshop. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Aditi. Hi, um, this is Aditi. Uh, thank you so much, Rukmini, for joining. Um, and I'm doing my PhD. I think, yes, I'm in second year now at uh, Brown University. And I'm really looking forward to this session because I've just started working on a couple of health-related questions. And um, I'm just exploring ways to make use of NFHS data. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. I think uh, we should uh, jump in. Um, I, I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk to the others who join now as well. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen to start with. Okay, I think this introduction was very useful for me as well because uh, I think on the whole, the level of uh, uh, you know prior familiarity with uh, numbers is a lot higher than I had anticipated. So what I uh, you know I am talking about analytics and communication. I'll keep the analytics part thin because I think there's more for me to learn than for me to uh, share on the analytics part, given everybody's broad. Uh, familiarity and I'll uh, uh, keep more focus on the uh, communications part. So just to uh, broadly share how I plan to structure this, um, I want to just give you a little bit of, of background about, the, um, about these two topics. Then I'd like to do a group exercise on communicating data, which uh, sorry, uh, on analyzing data, which we could do similarly. Uh, nobody needs to switch their videos on if they don't want to, but it would be nice to go around so that everybody has, uh, you know, gets a chance to participate. Uh, we could take a short break and then let's talk about the communicating data as well as the group work on the NFHS part. I'll keep that a little longer and keep the first exercise shorter given the, uh, you know, group's expertise. And then happy to take any questions that you have in, in the last 15 minutes, even in the coffee break, um, I'm happy to uh, treat it like office hours and have. Uh, questions for anybody who has them. So let me just jump right in. Uh, one of the things, you know, which is part of the disclaimer that I put at the beginning is that a lot of people assume that uh, that a data journalist work involves doing very complex math uh, and statistics most of the day. While uh, that's not the case for several reasons. In my case, one of the reasons that's not the case is because I don't have those skills. Secondly, the lack of uh, data, you know, the issues with data availability are so immense that a lot of the time gets spent in really focusing on accessing data. So uh, this, the, the first one was a tweet by a Washington Post data journalist, who the, Stephen Rich, this point about trying to ask for data back in the format that you know the government already has it in. And it, it rang so true because you know that there has been a spreadsheet somewhere that got converted into that PDF and your job ends up being trying to ask that person to put it back into that Excel sheet. But in the case of India, I think one additional thing is that you're also trying to get um, somebody to comment, to get somebody to tell you why the data that was available two months ago on that site is not there, has it gone behind the login. So a lot of my job ends up being this, which is trying to get somebody on the phone or trying to sort of uh, bring in uh, data that should be widely available. And the other, uh, and I know all of you who deal with data are very familiar with um, uh, format issues. And you know, all of us feel like we have a story of the worst data format, but to me, this really takes the cake. Avinash Celestine used to be at uh, Economic Times and now is part of the team that runs a website called howindialives.com, which again focuses on uh, telling stories through unit level data, particularly from the census. He was looking for some agricultural data from Karnataka and got very excited when he saw an Excel sheet until he found that it was an image of an Excel sheet, a JPEG, cut pasted back into an Excel sheet. So unusable in two or three different ways. Um, so yeah, just to, just to sort of start off by saying that 
data access can be a challenge in some areas it's improving i would say the nfhs which we're dealing with in the end is at the a uh, very good end of uh, data access the dhs website makes makes life very easy um i would say most of the nss also has got a lot better because of the micro data catalog on the government's website so we find ourselves using a lot more unit level data uh, of course variable names column names all of that there's still a lot of manual work involved and one of the big parts of what i'm hoping to do in the months going ahead is to ease that barrier for people that uh, access to uh, you know simple social economic things should not be this challenging anymore so just a couple of quick steps that i usually follow while analyzing data from a large government data set i know that these will be uh, things of uh, you know great familiarity to most of the group over here so you, you the way it works for me typically is that something that i have read or uh, been in sort of discussion with other people which sparks off a thought and that leads to the formulation of a question or a hypothesis then it immediately becomes important to figure out where to access that data and i'll spend a minute talking about sources of data after this even though i know that many of you have familiarity with that then a large part of the job really becomes cleaning and organizing the data because until it is in a you know perfectly usable format there's very little you can do with it and then the the process i usually follow while writing for a because i write for a lay audience is that i try to then organize that data into summary statistics because it helps me condense my uh, thought process when i have an extremely large data set i feel like there are trends and things i'm seeing in it but when i bring it down to easy summary statistics that i can put into a chart that's when it really helps me encapsulate my argument sometimes i even convert it into a chart just because that helps me uh, really sort of condense it into what exactly i'm talking about from that chart i'm able to almost see a headline a subheading a first paragraph from that chart so that's sort of the uh steps i follow you'll notice in the last step i've underlined the word address the question or hypothesis i'm not saying uh confirm the the question or hypothesis because finding that the numbers do not in fact confirm your uh question or hypothesis or take it in another direction is should be an important part of this process of inquiry and uh, you know to all of you in academia are well aware of the Uh, challenges to uh, uh, challenges about a null hypothesis and the lack of sort of broader academic interest in it i do encourage people to go in with an open mind and uh, you know uh, try to engage in less polarized conversations that are more uh, honest towards the data so less polarized conversations for the sake of some sort of world peace is not what i'm saying but when the data is saying something that sort of in between two poles being being honest and being sort of Uh, having that integrity to the data i really think does a good service to the people we're trying to communicate with so this is something i typically share with uh, people less familiar with with data sources which i think you know applies much less so to to this group so sometimes journalists can go in with with very interesting questions and uh, maybe this happens to some of you as well but you very quickly have to become very pragmatic about what you can and cannot say so if you are trying to say something about the recent past then it becomes very important to try and uh, you know get a good sense of what data is available and what you can realistically say with it or not so for example uh, until maybe a year ago or uh, 6 months ago until a new nss round called the multi indicator survey came out we'd had no fresh data on migration since the 2011 census so you there's a lot that you might want to say you might take the decision to use nfhs data for migration you might take the decision to look at cmi for migration or you might decide that both of them do not meet the bar for good migration data and just have to accept that there's nothing very recent i can say about migration while i'm on migration that same data source that's very exciting to use now the multi indicator survey from the 78th round of the national sample survey was conducted in a pandemic year so there is good reason to uh, have concern that it's not a representative year so again do you do you use it and do you say um, 
I'm using it however it was in a year that's likely to be showing some unlikely or uh, unusual trends. So this sort of pragmatism about what data exists and what you can say uh, really is essential. Um, I think it's also becoming increasingly important to educate the Indian public about the fact that we have to be a bit pragmatic about what data exists. So when you use 2011 census data and people immediately say, how can we, I mean, how is it of any relevance? It's, uh, we have to grow that data literacy in people for them to understand that there are things that there simply isn't more recent data available for. So just starting by saying, let, you know, figure out what data is available and then decide whether you even can answer the question that you've set out to ask. Then again, the, the second one applies particularly for journalists who are on deadlines. But I would say that a broad familiarity with Indian data sources is a great uh, tool to have because it cuts down on your search time otherwise. So I think a lot of people uh, uh, you know, start with trying to maybe even go through every NSS round or then look at uh, the NFHS to see if it answers all of these questions and being quite unfamiliar about where to go for what data. Or you might feel that, uh, I think in the case of health in particular, this becomes a big challenge where it's not entirely clear if you want to look at data on uh, disease surveillance and death, where do you go for it? So I call this peacetime work. So this is work that you're not trying to do in a, in a pandemic. You're not trying to do on a budget day where, where newspapers might be interested in what you have to say. You're doing it in your downtime where you're really trying to familiarize yourself with the landscape of the data in your particular field. I actually recommend to people to almost build it like a glossary for yourself. Open a Google Sheet call each worksheet something different, call one health, call something else, list the variables that are of broad interest to you and put down the name of the data set and the link. Now, once again, I feel like this is actually something that should exist. Someone's unmuted, you might want to mute yourself. This is something that should exist as a public service. Not everybody should have to you know, put in this work. So there are now a couple of um, repositories I see. They are not always perfectly organized uh, by, uh, uh, you know, area of interest, but there are a couple. I'll share one in the uh, chat later. Just, I don't know who this person is. I think he's a student, uh, PhD student who's put together one good uh, glossary of microdata repositories. I'll share that here. That's uh, something me and the people I work with are also working on. But in the absence of that, or particularly for the field that you are interested in, build a peacetime glossary of data sets so that you can, you know, pull it up in a big hurry in an in a emergency when you need to do it quickly. Now, one would assume that one data uh, set on a particular issue answers most of the key questions. So you would think that you can go to the NFHS and also uh, be able to say something about expenditure on health. But that's, that's not the case. As we know, you know, information on health expenditure comes from the NSS typically. Again, that's a few years out. So being familiar about what data sources you can use for what is important. Additionally, there is some knowledge that sort of develops almost by consensus, which I, I actually think is a problem. I feel like there should be more solid writing about this. But there is a broad consensus about what one should use and should not use some data sources for. As someone from outside academia, this can be mystifying for me too. So I'm not saying this is a solution, but uh, just as a heads up. So for example, there is broad consensus that although income data is collected in every NSS round to prepare deciles for the NSS round itself, this is not good enough data to produce consumption expenditure uh, estimates. There is a consumption expenditure around the CES, which we all know now is uh, 12 years out of date because the last one, the 17, 18 one was withdrawn. So there's consensus that only those should be used. Uh, so you might find as we did that when we started looking up at other NSS rounds and found that consumption, the consumption question was being asked, you might, there, nowhere does it tell you that you can't use it. So as academics who, who are held to higher standards than I am as a, as a general interest reporter, you will need to build some sort of familiarity about these unsaid do's and don'ts about what data you can use for what. Um, it might involve asking people more senior in the field, and then maybe we should all make this data more um, uh, democratically available, right? We well, shouldn't be gatekeeping this sort of consensus about what we use for what, along with the justifications for it. Um, 
sometimes uh, i see this happen uh, you know much more often than i than i would imagine there is sometimes an extreme slicing and dicing of data that you begin to see uh, to the point that your that the cells you end up looking at are so small that that it's it's quite surprising that um, you know that this was published so i would say uh, uh, you know form for yourself again from knowledge gathered from seniors um ideas around what should be the minimum sample size for the particular cell that you're looking at and then decide just how closely to slice and dice the data so with the ihds for example the india human development survey which is currently in the field and is was last there for 2011 12 and i'll share some data from uh, from that for our first exercise it is representative at the state level broadly uh, and not at the smaller state level uh, smaller states level is what they say however i do see people use uh, income wise caste wise interstate comparison data from it uh, in published papers as well so thinking about and you know it does produce interesting uh, results but thinking a little bit more deeply about uh, how far you should slice and dice the data especially if it is producing results that are consistent with your hypothesis where the temptation is greater is something i would encourage you know more people to spend more more thinking around now one of the things i do as a journalist but again i am less sure about how this works in academia is to try and triangulate with more than one uh, data source i do see this sometimes in published work as well so uh, with the covid mortality work for example when we started seeing these trends come out of the civil registration system one thing uh, one a sort of way to look at it was to also consider other data sources like at that time the uh, hmis the nhm national health missions administrative uh, uh, system now this is a data set that is not meant to produce estimates of mortality so it would sort of come into my third point which is this consensus around although they collect mortality data there is a consensus that this data is not good enough so should you use it here well i think what can happen with triangulation is that when multiple data sets point in a similar direction it produces knowledge of interest so that that is something that you could consider doing or consider thinking of when it comes to triangulation and then now i find it very interesting you know one of the participants mentioned that he's been listening to the webinar series that we've been doing and i've uh, uh, found it very interesting to ask uh, experts in each field to suggest what they think are novel data sources towards the end of of every webinar i'll share details of that webinar as well at the end of it now the reason this is interesting of course it comes from a place of scarcity which should not which is not an ideal world right we know that there isn't very recent migration data available or there isn't very uh, there wasn't very recent uh, mortality data available but as a result of that what solid uh, experts and academics are coming up with as novel sources is extremely interesting sometimes this is uh, not published and you know something that could be worked on or even replicated so for example uh, chinmay tumbe points out the work that uh, professor irudaya rajan and others did using uh, roaming trai roaming data uh, to consider uh pandemic time uh, migratory movements now uh, you know it, it it opens up a great uh, uh, possibility for other work that can be done around similar novel data sources so just some some broad points on data sourcing beyond uh, you know what you might be largely familiar with again because these are yes aditi you had a question yes rukmini um i so right now i'm working on um like i said some health related questions and what i'm seeing is uh i'm working along with ashish and payal and we are finding that uh different data sources for the same indicator are giving giving us different results so when you come across things like that what what is the approach and um, how often have people reported this problem when they are looking at multiple data sources for the same question yeah no that's important and i think once again uh, i am sort of at the lucky end of things out of not being in academics so to me the the, the reason that multiple data sources produce uh, can produce sometimes different uh, outcomes can become a source of uh, information and 
and interest so just to give you an example i think you know many of you might have engaged with the discussion that happened in the last couple of days around uh, population estimates now without getting too too deep into that let's just stick to the point that comes out from it which is there is a discrepancy you know forget the rest of it but there is a discrepancy uh between um, population projections uh, from of the 2011 census and what appear to be actual measurements of population uh, as derived from the nss and other surveys not actual measurement what comes from uh, nss and other surveys now uh, suppose we were producing uh, suppose w- what i was interested in producing here was a population number for india suppose that's the question i went in with what is india's population today and then i would look at these multiple data sources and find different things in them to me that is a piece of knowledge why are multiple sources producing different things what are the assumptions that go in behind uh, go in uh, for each of them uh, um, is a piece of knowledge so um, you know we, we might want to think about what are the fertility and migration assumptions that went into the 2011 census so just because i was looking at this uh, the last couple of days the the 2011 census holds migration um, uh, 2011 rates of migration constant now i because we have you know unit level data from this 2019 21 multiple indicator survey from the nss i tried to figure out what the migration rates from that are and they are enormously different from from the 2011 census some in expected direction some in unexpected directions so uh, that if i was writing about it publicly that would have been a point i would want to make which is here is the landscape of why these numbers could be different i think if the interest is really in trying to understand why rather than making a polemic point as as happened in that uh, population piece uh, there is knowledge to create and to add over there so uh, to me this migration one is fascinating so for example the you know it needs more work but what i found for example is that the net migration rates of kerala and tamil nadu were pretty similar as assumed as uh, you know put out by the census in their 2011 projections but they are incredibly different now there, there have been very different uh trends in in migration in kerala and tamil nadu so uh yeah i mean i don't think i'm answering your question very well from an academic perspective because i do see that producing a paper which says here we've looked at these different sources for one thing and they all say different things and here are all the interesting reasons they say that i don't think academia is as uh, tolerant of the spirit of open questioning as uh, you know a newspaper might be so the uh, this is my sort of lucky end of it but uh, i'll just you know leave you with a broad point that i do feel that we don't give people enough window into methodology and into background data we we feel that outcomes alone are what is worth reporting and talking about and the more discussion there is around the assumptions and the sort of background plumbing of indian data i i do believe that is of interest to people and that helps advance you know the discussions around data and data literacy as a whole so i'm not sure if this helps you for the paper but in uh, public writing that you might want to do around these multiple data sources to try and understand why they are producing these different uh, estimates would be would be perhaps a broader interest to groups like this or to uh, you know less polemical or less sort of straight jacketed academic uh, uh, communities just just yeah, that no, point yeah thank you so much this is this is really helpful and i think even when the academia doesn't allow us to you know press just present them with the different uh, outcomes from different data sources maybe it could also be a point to engage in where we don't know which is the correct data source to believe and and then that would question the entire analysis done so far um but yeah thank you <laughs> yeah yeah thanks okay so just uh, again this is something i know uh, people here will be much more familiar than me with but i'd just like to give you a broad landscape of some of the ways in which data sources are organized so the landscape of data sources as i said varies a lot by field uh, i i'd be happy if people have individual questions to come uh, to suggest some of the data sources i found useful 
but here are some of the sort of broad ways in which data can can be structured as well as understanding the implications of each so understanding what it means to be using census versus survey data without necessarily uh placing one above the other uh is important i think for people who use opinion polling data there's a whole additional range of questions to consider i do think that we we and you know because these uh, just as the plumbing point that uh that came up in aditi's question because we don't usually give people a good sense of what the question was asked we often interpret the answer in in a way that is uh, slightly inaccurate so most questions around why did you vote for x party or many times they are multiple choice questions and then so if we don't present that information fully we feel like oh you know people are only interested in a very sort of specific set of issues we don't allow for people to hold two thoughts at the same time or to uh, counterbalance those you know i care about jobs however i also care about we don't allow people to do that so it's important to consider particularly for opinion polling the very specific nature of how the question was asked as well as whether it was in person or not all of that um i think for academia this becomes particularly important but i wish more journalists would do it as well which is to draw a bar that says that uh, surveys which do not make there are data available which are opaque about their methodology which do not clearly say who commissioned or paid for them should really be uh, you know a bar should be drawn and we shouldn't be writing about those at all of course if we did draw that bar then uh Uh, during elections we'd have practically nothing to write about because almost all of the opinion polling around elections doesn't you know meet any of these we we rarely know who has paid for some of the biggest opinion polls in india and i think there's good reason to sometimes think they've been paid for by both uh, political parties and uh, media houses at the same time one subsidizing the other in in very dangerous ways i'm just going to briefly talk about the last two points over here uh today in in today's uh, work we are not going to work from raw data though i imagine that uh, many of you already do that uh it's something that i am relatively new to not having uh, you know much background knowledge about this but i have been finding it uh, very valuable as it's really allowed me to take a big step forward to be able to work from raw data and the reason for that is because uh the reports that accompany large surveys have a very specific set of uh tables and in fact if you if you look at the nfhs year after year you'll realize that those same tables are uh, done in those same ways what it means then is related to the last point what it means then is that the cross tabs so the the combination of rows and columns that they look at is is determined and in a sense a narrative almost is built through the through the choice of those cross tabs what working with raw data allows you is to create your own cross tabs in a way you set your own narrative and you're not forced to look at the same questions in the same way that the report has now i have found this uh, really like mind widening in some ways so for example with this multi indicator survey the nss 78th round there's one question which is on phone usage and the question the first question or the first table it produces is uh, uh whether men women rural urban have phone or uh, you know uh, exclusive use of phone household use of phone uh, use of non household members use of phone uh, sorry non household members phone or don't have a phone now that don't have a phone column which is pretty substantial like 30% uh is not included from the next uh, tables onwards the rest of the tables all try and understand among those who use phones what can we say about it now to me all i'm interested is in are the cross tabs of that last column who are the people in india who don't have phones and are along all of the different sort of dimensions of interest now until now because i did not have the ability to work with raw data i i realized that in some ways you have to go along with the narrative that is set by uh, by the report perhaps but intentionally and intentionally so i would highly recommend um, you know um, being able to move beyond the specific cross tabs that reports uh, draw to be able to say uh, additional things um though we are not going to be able to do that today from the nfhs uh, it's it's certainly something we'll discuss and think about what additional cross tabs could be of interest which you would then be able to um, pull from the from the dhs yourself so 
this again i mean this was meant to be a comforting uh, slide for people um, with my level of uh, you know uh, technical abilities but i think over here most people are far past this but let me just say that for a lay audience uh, particularly for those of you who are interested in writing for newspapers if you can do these basic this level of functions in excel you can write for a lay audience um simply being able to look at a, a data set and to be able to produce it as percentages relative to the population of a state or percentage relative to um, a population of social group or religion is in a, is in itself insightful enough to produce work for a lay audience because of uh, just how densely indian data is otherwise organized so i know i can see most of you are far beyond this but let me just say if you have the ability to work at this level with data in excel uh, please consider yourself ready to write for a lay audience and you know uh, don't think that you need to do anything much more advanced than this so uh, sorry i think the rest of this has not rendered i have i have more tips um, what we're going to do a little bit is doing some amount of data cleaning now this is something that i know all of you are familiar with in your work but without it being in in mere summary statistics condition you will find it very difficult to organize your thoughts or write quickly around it so keeping data extremely clean is something i you know focus a lot on including things like have just one row and have just one uh, one row head and one column head so that things can be uh, you know uh, numbers can be organized as easily as possible another very important point which i said at the beginning is that i am a big fan of looking at asterisks italics disclaimers method methodology limitations in every report uh, they, they they are often kept so uh, uh, you know uh, the part that's not said out loud as to be almost able to miss it so just as one example with police statistics the national crime records bureau in 2012 i believe decided to start using as in as the denominator for crimes against women the female population while until then what they had used was the overall population now what this meant is that the denominator was halved right you ended up halving the denominator between one year and the next but that was it it was in one tiny asterisk at the bottom of the table uh, for crimes against women so a whole lot of people ended up saying that there had been a huge increase in the rates of crimes against women while what had actually happened was that there was a halving of the denominator if you had just gone to the pdf in and there is only pdf so if you had only gone to the pdf in 2011 and 2012 and had just missed this asterisk the, you know without intending to do so this is what uh, could have happened to you so it becomes extremely important to to read up on um, on things like this similarly uh, asterisks and disclaimers around uh, who the question was asked to so you will find while using the nfhs for example is that there is a, there is a district module and a state module so sometimes when you're trying to look at a question you find that the numbers have shrunk suddenly and you're not really able to tell why it is then when you only when you go back to the questions you're able to figure out that that question was only asked at the state level and so the numbers have you know shrunk substantially so reading up very closely on the fine print is important i think a lot of people feel that um, that these sort of uh, methodology physical points are hard to communicate or not of interest to a lay audience but just see this point about um, the halving of the population right you can imagine being able to phrase it in a pretty people friendly kind of way it's not very hard to explain that the crime rate began to be calculated on all women rather than on all people and so that meant that you know even if the numbers were same the rate would be doubled you you'd be able to explain that reasonably uh, well so i would say that uh, uh, you know explaining this these sorts of points is very important so what i'm going to do now is jump into this uh, i think for most of you as i said it's going to be a bit basic so let's just use it almost like a, a warm up exercise if you can all follow uh, along this link it's just a, a google sheet of some isds data i i have it here i'm just going to click on the link but i think sorry i'll just go back to the sheet 
so that you can see it. And then once you see it, I'll stop sharing so that we can all work. Here. So if you just type in your browser, the same link, you will come to a Google Sheet. Believe me when I say that uh, when I do this, this sort of exercise for journalists, uh, I'll explain to you the, the, the level of uh, you know, unfamiliarity with looking at numbers that, that typically is there among uh, employed journalists in mainstream publications. And this isn't, you know, a criticism of them. It's a, it's a, our education system that makes people so afraid of numbers that, uh, you know, uh, this becomes important. For most of you, it will be something you're familiar with. Does, if everybody has this open, it should take you to an IHDS Google Sheet, uh, what I'll also do is I'm going to, I should have done this earlier. I'm just going to put it in the chat. I've shared it in the chat. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can all follow along. And again, if you don't mind, I'm going to call on you. It's going to be way below your level for most of you here, but let's just treat it as a warm up exercise. And I'll explain to you in a minute what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so here's some background of what this data set is. This is from the 2011-12 IHDS. This is round two of the IHDS, which is conducted by the National Council for Applied Economic Research in co collaboration with the University of Maryland. IHDS three is currently in the field. So I'm excited for what we'll be able to do next year when the data uh, comes out or towards the end of this year. In addition to uh, questions, uh, e economic questions, there are uh, questions around behavior attitudes uh, on uh, gender relations and caste relations. It uh, became the key source for the production of estimates of uh, practices of untouchability, for example, uh, the paper by Professor Amit Thurat and others was uh, based off this data set. So that's just a broad sense of what, uh, what you can get from the IHDS. Now I'll tell you why I usually do this and um, what would be useful to do over here as well. I've gone into the uh, first tab, which is about, um, as the NFHS calls it, nuptiality. So it is to do with, um, you know, marriage and uh, marriage related questions. Now, most Indian journalists have uh, left math behind a long time ago. And what often ends up happening is that, uh, particularly for people from a, a, a arts background, me included, uh, a fear of numbers often develops. So one of the first things I do usually is to show this number here. Percentage married before age 18, 48%. Um, and then I ask people, so how many were married when they were above the age of 18? And I kid you not, usually, uh, not very often is there anybody in the group able to answer it. So people have left math behind a long time. People have developed a fear of math uh, and are not using math in their regular daily um, work. So, um, one of the reasons this is important to think of is because if you're writing for a general audience, you are often writing to people with this level of unfamiliarity and fear of numbers. So thinking about ways in which to make numbers uh, less intimidating and more accessible should be an important part of how we all approach it and really coming at it from a place of empathy, not thinking of it as uh, people are, you know, uh, so frivolous, they don't want to read things with numbers. Often data journalists will say this, see, see what was in the top most read in, in the Hindustan Times, it is some Bollywood ego, people are not, uh, don't care about numbers. But think of it from the perspective of someone who is truly frightened of numbers, has been told in school that if you don't understand numbers, or you did badly in math, you are stupid. That is how, you know, people are often made to feel. So that phobia develops, takes hold, is very strong. And so if you were writing about this, uh, if you were, uh, you know, an RA on the 
IHDS and you wanted to present your findings, then think of ways you might want to phrase it. So I'm going to ask you, encourage you to tell anybody is free to uh, raise their hand maybe. If you can, just this very first number, can you think of a, a sentence in which to communicate it without using a number in it? Okay, you're writing the first line about this, but don't use a number in it. You can raise your hand and I can um, call on you. And Japneet, if I miss someone who's raised their hand, please call them yourself. So this is the number. This is cell B5 that I'm on. Try and put it in a sentence without using a number. Words that stand in for numbers are fine. Paraphrasing of numbers is fine, but try not to use an actual number. Yes, Rohit, please unmute and. Uh, I might be wrong, but uh, I think something like nearly half of India is married before their legal age of marriage or like yeah, exactly. Marriage. Yeah. So I think nearly, exactly. Nearly half is a much more uh, uh, easy to understand way of putting it. So I encourage people to use things like almost half, less than half, a quarter, a majority, one out of two. These are all far more uh, easy to understand ways of paraphrasing numbers. And I would say particularly in the first few lines, now there are a lot of, uh, again, unsaid rules or maybe even said uh, rules about communicating numbers that sometimes um, I uh, push back against because let's not turn everything into a formula. You know, uh, there are some... When you pick up a newspaper, sometimes you know that there's a typical way in which sometimes things are written, like a feature story which starts with a person's story. And then, it, and sometimes these become tropes and they become tiresome to read. So uh, one of the things that you are always told as a data journalist is do not start with a number, start, start with text. And I will say that I have often felt like rebelling uh, against that and maybe not followed it sometimes. Like I do think 1% is a telling number. If you say only 1% of Indians something, uh, I don't think you need to provide a ton of context. I think anybody knows that 1% is not chota hota hai. It's a small number. Even if people might take a minute to say, is that one out of 100, one out of 1,000, people get confused about that. I do think 1% has the ring of a small number. But something like this, if you went with 48%, I don't think 48% has much impact. It is a... Um, uh, it stands neither here nor there. And this is a good example of uh, encouraging uh, people to start with text in the first line itself. So if you were to say here, um, as Rohit did, which is nearly half of uh, Indian women were married before the legal age as of the 2011-12 uh, ISDS, I think that conveys the, the point quite well. Um, then to the point on uh, looking at two things at the same time. Uh, also, let's do one before that rather than two things at the same time so one point uh, is looking, uh, thinking about how to put things in words the second point I want to make is looking at two, three numbers at the same time so that you see them in terms of trends rather than individual numbers now again I think in academic terms what you would tend to do would you might look at uh, correlation coefficients, you might look at standard deviation but I would say if you're writing for a regular audience, thinking of phrasing things in terms of broad trends uh, is, is a very sort of standard part of how we write about it. So similarly, I would want someone to uh, unmute and suggest if, if you thought that you might want to write something about the relationship between uh, education and uh, child marriage. What potentially would be um, 
of a sentence you might start with. Again, we're not going to use any numbers here. The relationship between education, which is here, rows 12 to 18. And let's just call it broadly child marriage, which is again column B. No numbers, but that you've decided that that's, that's the point you want to make. Again, please feel free to um, raise your hand and without using numbers, you want to communicate a broad trend. I actually think it's much simpler than, uh, I, mean, I mean, don't overthink it is my uh, point. Now, I don't think anyone here uh, wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, Pratik, please go ahead. So women with uh, lesser levels of education are more prone to get uh, married of child marriage. Right. So if you were uh, writing it as the first line of a, a public facing piece, you might say that um, as, uh, you know, with growing education or as education levels uh, rise, uh, the likelihood of uh, child marriage goes down. Of course, as academics, what you would do is you would want to see what confounders are there, right? Like is, is uh, education essentially a, a product of income if you find that uh, in the unit level data that you know that, that they're closely tied together then you might reconsider whether you want to look at education alone you might find that education really stands in as a proxy and the biggest determining factor really is income or something else so th this is an oversimplification assuming that we're looking only at education and uh, child marriage then yes then you would we would answer it uh, in, in the way Pratik put it. So my broad point being that when there are data sets that give you uh, either aggregated data like this in a few buckets, or if you had the unit level data and you decided to create your own buckets, you looked at education, suppose it gave you years of education and you decided to create five buckets of that. And then you saw this clear trend. Now what I would typically do is I would just make a bar chart over here and I would see what's happening with the slope over there and then I would decide whether uh, how to phrase it that slope of the bar chart itself would typically give me um, an idea to think about uh, did uh, Vinayakan did you have your hand up did you want to say something as well oh I was just confused how we can go about it as a causation um, so uh, yeah you, you responded to that thank you Yes, uh, clearly this is, uh, you know, above my pay grade. <laughs> so at my uh, basic level, this is how I would say. But yeah, you would uh, most certainly find that these would not be single uh, uh, single cause sort of uh, uh, relationships. But if you were looking at these two indicators, this is broadly how, how you would phrase it. Um, what I want to do now is to try and look at two indicators together. So I'm going to, or two sort of ideas together. If you can go to the second tab, so that's 10.2. Um, tell you the, yeah. So I would like someone to look at, um, broadly look at column D. So column D, asks about women who've married in the same village or town and uh, come up again with, uh, you know, this could even be, uh, just think of it as a broad first line that you would then work on further. But what potential impact, uh, what potentially could this tell you about um, migration? So 
So one way to do columnly is that you would say the percentage of women who marry in the same village or town is as of 2011-12 was 12 percent. But if you wanted to take it one step further and you wanted to think about migration, what potentially would you, uh, what direction would you potentially go in? This could be more like what, what is your hypothesis? Because we don't have all of the information in this chart, but what hypothesis could this push you towards? Yes, Asad. Migration due to marriage is not too significant. Sorry? Uh, migration due to marriage is the uh, yeah. marriage is not a major reason for migration. Uh, sorry, marriage Why is not a major reason. You... Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just because that number is low, the meaning whether it's same town or not might have been your confusion, right? Yeah, so essentially, if migration I saw this, this would... For migration for me, right? Exactly. If I saw this number, I would immediately want to go to the migration uh, tables because what this would suggest to me would be two things. One is that practically every married Indian woman, so it'd be... 8% of Indian uh, married women from this would be uh, migrants, right? If the definition of migrant here was to be in a place that is not the village or town that you were born in, it would make 88% uh, 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 of Indian uh, married women migrants. That's one. Then immediately it would take me to overall migration numbers and it would make me potentially make the argument that uh, marriage migration might be the largest component of Indian migration. I mean, 88% of women is a huge number. You'd want to see what male migration looks like. But yeah, it would draw you towards thinking about just the magnitude of migration that is determined by uh, female marriage practices. So the, yeah, this in terms of analyzing data, this would be to me one example of uh, looking at... Um, uh, one set of numbers that produce a hypothesis that pushes you towards another data set and together, uh, you know, takes you towards a question that you might more broadly want to answer. Um, and just let's do one last one. Um, this one. Okay. So let's keep this one a little open-ended. Open Go to tab 10.5 and I'm going to keep this uh, open-ended, which is uh, look at column G. And then you have a range of uh, indicators here, right? You have, you could look at age, you could look at education, you could look at religion or caste group, and you can look at states. But we're looking only at G, which is head covering, column G. So I would like you to produce a one line hypothesis or question or even what you feel might be the first line of what you might like to write about, about head covering on any of these demographic indicators on the left. So this is open ended, no right or wrong answers. Uh, something that comes up of interest that you might write about for a general audience, the first line of it. Yes, so indicator is of your choice. Okay, I'm seeing some of the responses in chat. So you can either put it in chat or unmute and uh, or put your hand up. Yeah. So uh, Japanese, uh, one which is most women in India practice Pada Gumbat in itself. I mean, although I've looked at these numbers often, that one number itself is quite uh, telling, right? Just uh, on its own as one. And then uh, if you wanted to look at a particular demographic indicator, um, I'm seeing some other ones. E yes, so Prashant has done that by comparing different uh, religious groups. 
and yes i would say vinayak and that is a, a very um, i mean that is i think pretty much the piece i would have written uh, i wrote for the, the hindu at the time which is um, this you know when you're thinking of numbers as a way of pushing back against uh, entrenched narratives then you really do see that right that it is not a, a pure it, the rate of head covering is higher among muslims but it is not a purely muslim practice in india right so sanan's point is about geographic location let me yes pratik on uh, north india yeah in fact i remember the numbers rajasthan in particular was extremely high let me look at the education point that suresh has made so if we look at g and education hmm so this i would see i think your point was about education i would say that we do see a fairly standard decline with education um uh, if you want to if you want to unmute and uh, share your point because otherwise i would say that there is a broad sort of decline with education yeah uh, i mean to say that that like if you see only the college at college to graduates have something mm. like 37 or 40% like it's something mm. like uh, above 50 right almost 50 so that's why i used most much mm but see it falls from 10 standard onwards it falls to below 50 and if you see it as a trend it pretty much solidly falls with education group right so i i don't think i would say that education doesn't make a difference yeah doesn't make a difference but i am saying that there is a like uh, much like maybe there is little difference yeah i mean i suppose it, i can see the point that even among the most educated a solid 4 out of 10 practice uh, but the gungat is potentially something you could make so of course what you would then do is look at other uh, attributes of uh, of these uh, you know at the unit level to try and understand what it is what is the most determinant factor over here i'm going to jump right into the next we'll jump right into okay going on pouring coffee okay so um, as we discussed in the first half i do think that the analyzing of the data part is uh, something that this group in particular will be uh, uh, strong on so let's focus on the <coughs> communication part of it and since some of you expressed an interest in either writing for a lay audience or you've already been doing it or in making your academic work more broadly available to a broad audience we are going to uh, sort of focus on that part of it um in general here are some questions that i try to keep in mind before um, starting to write i do think considering who, who considering who your audience is is very important i was very interested that one of the participants mentioned that she is interested in writing for uh, in multiple languages now it isn't something that i had paid much thought to earlier because i only wrote in english but from time to time when i write uh, in non english uh, media uh, usually it is languages in which i'm not strong enough to write from scratch in so it is translated and you really sort of uh, realize uh, how specific the uh, you know the linguistics around numbers can be in different languages so uh, just as an as an example there are entire uh, findings from numbers i have had to rephrase because uh, or sort of redo because they just did not lend themselves uh, well enough in hindi when i was writing at one point and right now this last week i've been writing something uh, uh, in tamil nadu now i'm not a native tamil speaker though i have learned 
recently so i'm not, i don't think in uh, tamil and the numbers we were uh, using we were phrasing them as um, people were some you know following something were more likely to or were less likely to and the uh, person we were writing for told us that this more likely to less likely to is very difficult to phrase in tamil and just would not have the same impact it we were phrasing it as a statistical concept that you know the the uh, compared to their share in the sample they were lower in something before and more later so more likely to so that that was useful feedback and the person told us that simply putting it as percentage increases following something so many more people did something was much more clear in tamil so who you are writing for starting from what language they are going to be reading it in is essential to understand as i said uh, i have come around late to the acceptance that there is uh, a barrier to numbers that ex- exists in many people's minds so to try and understand whether you are writing for people with some familiarity with numbers because there are a lot of people who would like you to get to the numbers immediately they do not need to go through the scenic route for three paragraphs before they get to that key number and would like to see right up front what your uh, findings are you you will know this from having read abstracts which uh, you know dance around the point and you are really waiting for uh, to understand what the exact finding was so if that is the audience you are writing for feel free to launch in with the number don't hold any of these as strict rules that you cannot bend in the writing of my book as well i, was, I tried often to start uh, with a story now as i said i don't like these tropes that you must start everything with a story because otherwise people will not be interested but in many cases the piece lent itself well to to starting with the story in many cases it isn't given that i had put that much thought into it the most compelling part of what i had uh, looked at was the story and i ended up starting with it so you too since many of you are researchers who work in the field as well might often find that starting with a person's uh, story is a very compelling way of starting however i should say that there are implications of starting of using stories as well it isn't a no brainer it isn't a costless choice so whose story you choose to tell are you telling the median person story and is that a sort of are you instrumentalizing that that this person represents the median now this is a trope you will see in data journalism in uh, um, you know mainstream publications Uh, a person is described and then in the second or third paragraph you go on to realize why they have been described perhaps they are talking about heat uh, waves growing heat waves so the person in that paragraph is a farmer in uh, north central india and then their story reflects the data points that are being made um, and perhaps they do pull, pull you in but i think there are sort of ethical or moral considerations there as well one of which is that what about outliers we know that outliers exist in in the numbers as well and if you're telling the story of a median what uh, what are the implications of choosing to tell that particular person's story so you know uh, i don't mean to uh, bog you down with so many questions that it becomes impossible to write but i will say that there is no one way uh, considering the value of stories and just how compelling they are to people is a good way to go about it however if you find that your audience is one that would like to get straight to the number feel free to do that these are not rules do do what feels uh, right and for the audience um be very uh, sort of upfront and clear about what you are trying to communicate so in the earlier discussion that aditi and i were having about the um, ambiguity that sometimes comes in, comes in from data sources do not feel that you need to flatten uh, questions uncertainty ambiguity i uh, you know feel that it is a disservice many of us have often done in trying to remove uncertainty so if i try if people ask me about some way that i felt i could have done better one of my uh, the, the one thing that often comes to mind is that i feel that i poorly communicated uncertainty around modeling in the early stages of the pandemic now one of the reasons was i didn't understand this stuff terribly well either i i didn't understand how you know i didn't understand what this pandemic was i was not a health reporter it was coming at me pretty fast i'm not a science journalist so trying to write about models was a challenge and then i did know that there were assumptions that go into any model but i cannot in, uh, say that i understood all of those assumptions they were far beyond my ability which doesn't mean that 
uh, I shouldn't have written about it or I couldn't have done a better job in, in uh, communicating uncertainty. But when we don't communicate that uncertainty, we create a crisis of credibility that is unfounded. So some, uh, you know, if you say that going by this exponential rate of growth right now, India could have X million cases by the end of whatever. Doesn't mean that it is going to happen. And if you don't get X million, means you are lying and we're wrong. It means that there are there is this band of uncertainty and you need to be able to explain within that. So similarly, I think things like population projections, fertility, which is moving in ways that are really quite unexpected. The uncertainty that goes into those assumptions is, is very important. Uh, sometimes it uh, again leaves you unable to decide what to do. So I in the past have used IHME's uh, numbers on disease modeling in India. And I do know now that so many of the assumptions in that are far beyond the realm of what are sort of acceptable levels of assumptions. So what should you do? Should you not produce any data on uh, the broad uh, landscape of Indian disease? Because we don't have it from other data sources. So, uh, you know, uh, figuring out how to fairly communicate uncertainty is certainly something I wish I had done better and would encourage more, more people to do. We no longer have space constraints. We are no longer uh, you know, forced to write for newspapers that only carry 400 words. Online, you know, much longer things can be taken. Footnotes are possible. However, text is possible. So we shouldn't let any of that uh, constrain us for the popular media. I know the rules of academic writing are different. Uh, as I said, I do feel that particularly in the beginning parts of a, of a report, paraphrasing numbers as much as possible to get to the central point is valuable. Similarly, I think it's useful to think simultaneously of charts and using text to simply be a paraphrase of numbers that go in a chart is a very frustrating experience. So sometimes you read, almost you feel like you're reading first row of the chart, second row of the chart, third row of the chart, and you're picturing it as a chart rather than in run-on text like this. So if you have, if, if your writing is going to allow you to have a couple of charts with it, I would encourage you to put those charts in early so that you're not tempted to uh, repeat all of the stuff in it. And in fact, if the charts come later, feel free to delete lines that essentially repeat that and think hard about what is best there in text and what best works in a chart. Uh, and then thinking about things like whether to express numbers in percentages, proportions, ratios, absolute numbers, and the implications of each of those are, uh, are often not just academic choices or even stylistic choices, but sometimes even political choices, right, depending on the, on the point that is being uh, made. Then additionally, there are elements that make what you're writing much more readable. So one is, of course, if you are writing for a lay audience and uh, can uh, bring in qualitative work and stories, that always adds to the richness of what you're writing about the other eth ethical considerations kept in mind. Additionally, if there is um, secondary research that uh, that explains some of the why in what you're finding, I think that's very valuable. So I think one of the big problems that happens with people writing with numbers, so we'll have this with the NFHS right now, for example, we will find some things in it and you know want to show it. But at one go, we're not going to be able to explain all the why of it too, right? That's going to need separate work, separate research. So thinking about what is existing published work or in the case of journalism, quotes of experts that allow you to get some way towards the why uh, is, is a valuable sort of um, element of uh, writing with numbers. There are, uh, as I said, you know, there, are, there aren't a lot of strict rules that I feel are necessary to follow, but here are just some uh, things that I ask people who write with numbers to keep in mind and many of these are actually derived from feedback that I've given after people write in with numbers. Uh, I think there's often uh, uh, you know very a lot of fuzziness in uh, how absolute numbers and proportions are expressed. So saying more of this and less of that when what you're uh, talking about is you know there is more of something in UP and less of something in Kerala there's more of everything in UP, right? So thinking hard about where you talk about absolutes and proportions is, is very important. From uh, in the work that you all do academically, you would have worked it out, but thinking about it and paraphrasing becomes important. And I'd encourage you to keep this in mind as we do our writing exercise now. Um, 
I find a lot of people use a percentage increase and percentage point increase interchangeably, uh, which is, you know, uh, very problematic, particularly when you try to recreate, you know, they'll say, so something, something is now 98%, which is, which is a, a 8% increase. And so if you're trying to figure out what it was in the past or what it is in that comparison place, you're left unsure of what they whether what they're doing is a percentage increase or a percentage point increase. So I, you know, highly encourage you to keep that in mind using the right words over there. Uh, the, this is the, the third point is something I make, uh, I try to say a lot to journalists, but I think applies less so over here. But going far beyond the numbers to claim things that are not shown by the numbers is just something that I wish everyone would avoid. You know, uh, if you are trying to make an argument that uh, that the numbers show something, um, going as far as what the numbers actually show is really something I highly recommend. So moving beyond it to, uh, to, to sort of make leaps of argument not held up by the numbers just ends up uh, you know, cutting away at the credibility of what you're trying to argue. So similarly, in the example of these population projections that got discussed recently, I, I'd say that perhaps if the piece had been written about as a discussion around uh, different measures of population and the sort of, you know, why are they different? I'd be on board. I'd be on board to uh, hear that. But if you take it to then immediately be, oh, then it means that this government's doing better, that one's doing worse, progress is understated, overstated, you know, that none of that is held out by the numbers at all. So it really sort of dents the credibility of what you're trying to argue. So make arguments. We are we are all here to, you know, we're all people with beliefs and we, we want to use numbers to advance those beliefs or share those beliefs, but uh, make sure that the point you're making is substantiated by the numbers for your own integrity and credibility. Um, the next point I had referred to earlier, which is think a little bit about whether the data source that you're using is meant to uh, produce numbers on that particular um, uh, indicator. And as I said, I don't think that these are widely established or widely uh, this knowledge is institutionalized. So speak to other people and let's all try and institutionalize uh, this knowledge. Um, and one of the things that happens is you you going you know you might run into this in the exercise that we do as well. If you've got a series of findings, okay. So if I'm asking you to uh, tell me everything that you can find about um, uh, female fertility, and in the NFHS you find first the fertility rates are given by rural urban, then they're given by education, this that all these different demographic things. There is a temptation to just run on as text one after the other. Fertility is higher among this, fertility among this is this. And you just keep running on numbers where it starts to look like a laundry list of just points one after the other. So I would encourage you to break up paragraphs by thoughts rather than by numbers alone. So if one paragraph wants to deal with the idea of the impact of education on fertility, uh, keep all the points relevant to that in one. So, so when I'm reading through it, I don't feel like I'm reading number after number. I feel like I'm reading thought after thought. Let the thought lead rather than the number. Um, that's another sort of broad um, piece of feedback I have from re reading uh, pieces that people send in. So let's jump right into it. I think you will have got uh, an email from Japneet. It's just the Excel version of the NFHS 5 India report. So it is formatted from um, a PDF, from, uh, you know, it's just reformatted. So it will be a bit in, in a bit of a mess. I'm going to open the same thing myself. And I'm just going to broadly tell you what we're planning to do. So that we're not all looking at different things. Let's uh, uh, look at one broad area. So let's look at well. The wealth index part in the NFHS, and I'll I'll come to you now on which page and table, etc. And I'd like you to do these three things, and then we can share them. Uh, you know, work on them together, and then share them. Uh, and I'll give you examples of all of this. So let's try and identify one or two limited data points about an area that we're interested in. I would then want you to put them together as summary statistics, or if you are someone who prefers to see things as a chart, I am. Uh, make a chart of that and we can discuss how to do that as well in uh, google sheets or in excel and then i'd like you to write 
two simple paragraphs of that data point for for a lay audience and we could share them here in the group and you know uh, get broad feedback from each other so i'm just i'm going to stop sharing uh, i'm going to open up the nfhs just to tell you the part that i'm uh, talking about just to tell you which table and i'll just share that portion i'm sharing it in the pdf but you'll find the same uh, charts in the So what we're interested in is household wealth by wealth quintile. And we're going to go to the detailed tables, not the summary part of it. I'll just tell you which page that will be in the PDF and then which page in the, uh, so then it'll be in the Excel as well. Let me just share this with you. And I'll give you an example of what I mean as well. So this is from the PDF report. And as you know, um, what the NFHS does is it collects information on assets owned by a household. And then it uses that asset information to create wealth quintiles. Quintiles are five divisions. So it creates these five divisions uh, of wealth. And then it uses these as essentially classes to talk about a range of issues. So this, this example here is about sanitation. And it uses, so you'll have the wealth quintile to talk about sanitation. Now, just to give you an example of what uh, I would, one example of how to do this particular exercise. We are all going to look at wealth quintiles, but to answer any question of interest to us, I would encourage you to stick to one or two data points so that you know the, the looking for the information doesn't end up taking you too much time. So suppose I decided to look at sanitation by wealth quintile. Um, I, I would then put this into this data alone into a chart. Since I've shared an Excel with you, it would be relatively easy for you to uh, uh, make summary statistics and then make a chart out of it. And I would write a two page story. So the, the two points that I'm interested in from the two paragraphs that you will write is one, what is the insight based on the wealth quintile that you're able to give me on the variable of interest that you have. And two, I want you to explain in a bit the wealth quintile to me. So, you know, the thing that we've been talking about is, uh, bringing greater uh, sort of understanding to people about the indicators that you're talking about in a way that um, expands understanding. So it's entirely possible that if you put the words wealth quintile alone while writing for a lay audience, maybe the Indian Express op-ed page readers would understand, but there would be a lot of people who would not clearly know what, you're, what you mean. So I want you to give it a shot of writing in two or three lines in the most accessible way you can think of to explain what wealth quintiles are. So maybe my first paragraph would say that then if it just shows that, uh, you know, that, that the, this is what the impact of wealth on sanitation is. And it means that those in the highest, blah, blah, blah. And then I would write one more paragraph explaining uh, what a wealth quintile is and how it is composed. Uh, and a little bit about sanitation. So I, I would explain the indicators in the second paragraph. So I'm just going to um, share the exercise page again so that everybody is on the same page about what we're working on. Okay. So these are the three uh, points that we're doing. We are using wealth quintiles in association with one data point. It can be about any part of the NFHS that you are interested in. Then you're going to produce short summary statistics where, again, if you were writing for an Indian Express or a Hindu, you would maybe give that information for a chart to be made or you would produce it as a 
uh, table uh, or if you were writing for uh, you know maybe a blog post around a, a paper that you've written so feel free to share it as a table or as a chart in excel if you want help working on charts i can help on that as well and i would like you to write two short paragraphs the first paragraph should be your insight and the second paragraph should be explaining variables including uh, the wealth quintile so what i'm going to do is i'll i'll be on here and if you want to ask me either on chat or you want to unmute and ask in any way uh, i can discuss this as you're going along and what what would be best is if we could all go around and read our two paragraphs uh, in about half an hour uh, or earlier so i'll keep it like that i mean I'll, if we were in person i would be able to circulate so just uh, you know start working on an idea and then uh, jump in to me with any questions and i'll be here and i'll just tell you time wise we are now it is 5 minutes to 5 ideally we should finish by uh, sorry 5 minutes to 4 ideally we should finish by 4:20 so that or 4:25 so that we have 20 minutes to go around and then we can leave 15 minutes for questions in the end and if there are any questions please ask me. i find it useful i find it useful to do it in to do charts So what you have here, uh, these are the wealth quintiles: lowest, second, middle, fourth, highest, highest being rich. And it's I find these these stacked bars very useful for a for this use case in particular. So of course you know ideally you would uh, put them all as same colors, graded from lowest to highest. Uh, Google Sheets. Uh, uh biases to its primary colors but it gives you a good picture at um, at one glance so this is one of the reason i like to you know otherwise what i would have here would be this table so you can see this table which tells you a similar thing but i find that when i put it in a chart it helps me write my first paragraph uh, very quickly so just just wanted to give you that as one example I like that when I can do chat GPTs help. <laughs> no, honestly, it's a good good use of GPT. yeah uh, when i can that's uh, excellent and uh, you know i would like you to share that in the broader group when we start uh, writing it up i would just want you to uh, sorry when we start sharing i'd like you to just think of adding um, a couple of lines on uh, wealth quintiles hmm? imagine that our readership is not familiar with wealth quintiles how would you explain it to them okay plan plan to take just another minute or so i can see that some have already you know so i'll i'll let the people done start who are done start first and just remember that i would like uh, to hear your understanding of the indicators in the second paragraph because that's almost as important as the insight being sure that we are able to communicate the meaning of the indicators okay so paragraph 1 for insight paragraph 2 to communicate what the indicators mean Okay, uh, Vinayakan, you got quite a long way through already. So, would you like to start? Uh, 
okay here in the chat i'm going to read it out maybe not read it out it's quite long Okay, so if uh, everybody sees in the chat, Vinayakan has uh, the chart that I tried to make was essentially of Vinayakan's idea, which is to uh, consider the intersection of uh, caste and wealth quintile. And what he finds is that um, marginalized groups, including scheduled tribes and scheduled caste, predominantly occupy the lower wealth quintiles. Uh, the uh, OBC group is sort of distributed along the mean in that way of the quintiles, while the others is concentrated, I would imagine, among the in the highest quintiles. Um, uh, here, the explanation also uh, is of wealth quintiles. Then I can one additional point I would say is that, uh, and I would say this is particularly because of the sort of um, uh, you know, questions that people have about how data is collected and whether it is representative. And I think that this is often a question that people have about wealth, that they feel that people are a lot wealthier and that surveys are not able to properly capture it. So giving people a very clear window into what is wealth, how it is calculated, is, I think, extremely worthwhile and helps build the credibility of what we're doing. So just in the way that in very simple terms, you put that if you imagine lining up households from uh, poorest to richest, then these would be the five groups. I would say in equally simple terms, I would encourage saying what wealth uh, is. So you would say, for example, that um, uh, the NFHS, which is a household survey, asks every household if they have one off or all of. Uh, the following assets including blah 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 if they have at least so many they are classified as poor if they have so many so i would give people a very clear insight into how exactly wealth is defined and i think that's uh, useful also because sometimes people particularly english uh, uh, media consuming um, audiences assume far greater degrees of wealth than actually exist. And so this becomes a reality check. So for example, I think one of the things the NFHS shows is that car ownership is very much in the single digits, if I remember correctly, which is one of those things that, you know, takes English newspaper reading audiences by surprise. So much more clearly explaining precisely what uh, wealth means is the one sort of improvement I would make about uh, on that. But otherwise, that's very interesting. So that's the first one. That's Vinayakan. Then there's Pratiks, which is which also looks at the intersection of um, caste and wealth. Uh, yeah. So uh, Pratik, I would say largely, essentially the same uh, feedback, which is I would want uh, to see a um, more relatable uh, description of what precisely wealth means otherwise yeah this would this would be of immediate interest i also feel that this lends itself very well to a chart and you know it would be very telling to see in a chart now naveen's is on alcohol So, Naveen, one thing I would say is that in line two, when you say various factors that it could be attributed to, unless we give some indication of where, what those factors are, this to me comes in the, if I was seeing it from a data journalist, I would put it in the category of editorializing, which is to uh, produce explanations that appear to be the writer's own, uh, you know, uh, to which I would usually be like, I would want to see a citation or a link or, or, or something to explain that. I mean, these seem like very likely factors, but I would still want to see that. And another interesting thing that you've done is what you've, you've tried to lead with larger numbers and then bring it down to the household numbers. So there's always a sort of, I mean, it's just a broad point to make. You know, in uh, we always see a discrepancy between administrative data and survey data, right? So similarly, we see a discrepancy between things like 
uh, sales of phones and actual usage of phones because multiple people uh, use uh, you know one person may use multiple sim cards while one person may use no phone at all so it's always uh, just something to keep in mind that when you're looking at sales or administrative data versus household data there might often be this discrepancy and it's something worth keeping in mind in a way it also in a way it lines up as the sort of difference between a mean and a median in a way like the mean may be driven up by the fact that one person may or some people may consume a lot while the median indian might cons- uh, consume quite little so just broadly making that point and i would say things like disposable income and urbanization while these might be explanations that we quickly reach reach out to i do think that in in the nfhs we see uh i thought we saw higher uh, consumption in among poorer households but i might be wrong so i would just check that against the uh, first two lines that so just sorry sorry, sorry? no no go on go on please go on in the case and i try to link with consumptive consumption because that's that's a very broad literature that suggests that poorer people uh usually uh, consume a lot of consumptive food and alcohol is one of them so i try to bring that factor and given that and if i just suggest that uh, lowest quintile are consuming more both in mm. men women and both in urban and rural spaces so that was my major point and i try to link with the income with increase in income that may not be the only factor but yeah data says that the some research that says that right right okay so that there is a decrease in alcohol consumption with an increase in wealth right okay so interesting uh, points to consider particularly for a hypothesis but i as I, i would say i would just caution against uh, ascribing causes um uh, um without you know further work but yeah this is you know for, this is an exercise and this is something that you would then look at you know other factors so uh, i i see the i see the points that you made over here i think it is nine if you, if you looked at and which is five then that will be 1920 just one uh, uh, small point there so i've seen uh, up to navins I don't think anything more has has been posted, right? So should we go around for the others? Would anybody else like to unmute and share what they've written? You could just put your hand up, and I can call upon you. No problem if it isn't uh, complete. If you just want to sort of. indicate the what you've been looking at kavita would you like to share what you've been working uh, looking at yeah i'm audible yes yeah just write down some sanitation uh, the, that that uh, we were talking sanitation service by well quantile so as well okay. quantile increases lowest to highest sanitation facility facilities have improved and uh, uh, reverses uh, unimproved sanitation, uh, sanitation facility uh, this is from uh, uh, lowest to highest that as increases from uh lowest to highest the imp- uh, sanitation in Im- unimproved uh, uh the sanit- uh, sanitation facility uh, facility has improved and uh, uh, uh in eastern part the bihar is lowest in improved sanitation facility and same okay. in the eastern part the west bengal is highest in the sare facility 
and with the limited uh, sanitation facilities and the major part is in all india lakshadweep uh, is highest in the improved uh, sanitation facility which is 99.8% and just uh, uh, second is kerala is uh, nearby to lakshadweep which is 98.7% okay okay what i would uh, you know want you to do in the next thing is to describe what uh improved sanitation means because again it's one of those terms that's quite uh, you know commonly used but not uh, sorry commonly used in academic work but not always fully understood so in the next uh, thing if you were to write i would want you to explain in as clear terms as possible what um improved sanitation means i would also say just one sort of broad uh, uh, caution which is that for uts uh, union territories in particular and sometimes for smaller states including northeastern states the numbers are sometimes skewed by the fact that the sample is small so you would want to just make sure that uh, you know i mean leading with lakshadweep would probably be something i would caution against and looking at the next biggest state might be a good idea but anyway that is that's uh, really something that would Uh, come out uh, further in the data work but yeah for now i would say I just want to uh, ask a question that uh, like yeah. it is in ut so is it uh, good to compare with the other state because ut is a small state and that the other state is, uh, is yeah uh, yeah i think ideally not so again it is one of those things where it's not that the nhs is saying that uh, it is not representative at the ut level but it is sort of uh like a consensus that numbers for most uts and in many uh, small states including in north, uh, in some of the northeastern states are uh, come out as outliers so i think the sort of broad consensus is to try and look at the ne- ne- next biggest state and typically to not look at uh, uts i think even when it comes to crime we end up finding this that the crime rates are sort of uh, uh, sort of Uh, you know outliers when it comes to the uts so i mean there's no one rule there are if if the uh, data set is supposed to be representative at that ut level then there isn't particularly a rule that you shouldn't but yeah just just something to broadly keep in mind okay okay thanks thanks yeah so okay i'm going to just look next at asad's uh, what asad has shared um Asha, Asha workers. Okay, so my bro, I'm looking largely at the second uh, paragraph, uh, Asha. Then my broad feedback would be to try and break it up into two paragraphs for two separate. ideas so if you're going to first talk about uh, the share who rely on asha workers for post natal health checkup uh, i see i see so what what you're trying to say is who you get a post natal health checkup from or whether you get a post natal health checkup at all is determined in part by Uh, how rich or poor you are, and you find that twenty six point three percent of the poorest group do not receive any health, uh, any checkup. So I would say what would be a useful indicate uh, useful here would be to slightly compare like with like. So I know I can see that this uh, the six percent and twenty six point three percent is a telling one, and if you put that in one sentence together, that would be telling. uh the 63.5% for uh, doctors i would want to see the similar one for poorer group so maybe you you could take the decision to actually do that in the chart and that you're only pulling up a couple of points but um, you know so the two things to avoid would be uh, run on numbers so that 6% 26.3% in one sentence would be very impactful and if you are bringing up this doctors point then i'm left feeling well what about doctors for poorer people so to just sort of square it over there that is in the next slide the last ah sorry 24.7% okay i see i see your point over there so um you know it's less less than half like the relative share is is less than half so 
yeah, it might be useful to put the two points, the, the richest and the poorest for doctors in one sentence and the richest and the poorest who don't get any checkup in one sentence. You might also want to think about what is the most impactful point to lead with. So I think the not getting a health checkup, which is more than a quarter of <clears throat> the poorest women, women is the most uh, impactful one for me. So you might choose to lead with that, right? That first, and you might choose that some of this comes uh, after that. So yeah, uh, a good point. And I can see that you've explained the, uh, you know, the quintiles being divided into five groups right there. Um, so yeah, great, thanks for that. Uh, I'm looking at Shravan's. Yes, so uh, as I mentioned, I would want to um, understand better what sanitation facilities mean. So some things like proper toilets uh, works when we're talking colloquially or casually, but I would want to know what a proper toilet actually means. People's definitions of proper toilets vary enormously. Some people think a full proper tiled bathroom with the flush connected to sewage is the only definition of a proper toilet. So you'd want to make sure that you're um, answering that. <clears throat> I think the bottom 20% of wealth is a, um, yeah, to my mind, it's a, a good way of putting it. I do feel that bottom 20% is something I understand faster than bottom quintile. Uh, so the uh, uh, poorest quintile. So the poorest fifth, the poorest 20%, I, I feel that these are, you know, easier to understand as concepts. So uh, thanks for that. I'm going to quickly look at uh, Saurabh's spreadsheet. Meanwhile, if anybody else wants to either raise their hand or unmute and share, that would be good. Okay, looking at Saurabh's who looks at um, birth outcomes by wealth quintile and finds that so so sort of um there are actually two, three processes going on at the same time. You are right in saying that as the wealth quintiles increase, the No, actually, the rates of both uh, abortion and miscarriage rise with increased wealth quintile. Um, and the share of live births is actually lowest among in the highest wealth quintile. So it's not, it's not decrease for all. And uh, in, in, in fact, the point about higher spending and birth outcome, you could actually ask a question over here because if you find that there is higher spending on uh, deliveries in the highest wealth quintiles, but simultaneously the lowest rates of live births, I think there's, there, there's a question to ask here. You would find there would be many co confounders, I imagine. Uh, including the fact that it's likely that uh, age at birth is higher in higher quintiles and that can affect birth outcomes. So I, I wouldn't say that this data alone answers that, but I would encourage you to re-look at the table and re-analyze uh, re that data because we actually, uh, from the numbers that you've put together, it shows that uh, live births are actually less likely in the highest quintile. Okay, I'm going to quickly call on uh, anybody else who hasn't. Uh, sorry, Sanna, have you already shared? No, Sanna, would you like to share? Uh, I saw uh, you had in the beginning talked about sanitation. Sorry, you have. You'd already shared the sanitation part. And as we discussed, I would just like to see a little more discussion around. Uh, definitions of sanitation and quintiles. 
Suresh, have you have you shared your work? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, I have written on the paper. Okay, okay. Please, please uh, go ahead. But it's not uh, too much meaningful. So actually, no, no, no I was problem. Trying with, trying with something else that I have. I want to uh, have a something like figure which you showed. I was trying with okay. the data, but uh, that's, okay, it's okay. not coming up. So no problem. Just, uh, what is the broad area want... that you're looking at? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, just a second. Sure. So actually, I am same. I am looking with this. Uh, uh, what is called? You have a uh, one side sanitations uh, where yeah. you see uh, different uh, types of sanitation, right? Mm. So uh, I was trying to link this side, three side, and this uh, we have five side, right? So I am trying right. to figure out the picture where I'll get something like. Uh, so if I take the lower quintiles. Uh, yeah. Then you see that there is something like thirty-seven percent, ten percent, and uh, so fifty percent. So right. I am fitting in that sense, but the figure yeah. which I got is a weird figures I am getting. So I just want to quickly show that once. Sure, sure, sure. Please do. I think uh, host disabled participant screen sharing, so it's fine. Okay. Uh, in a, sure. What I'm going to do anyway right now is leave my email address for the people who had specific questions uh, so uh, Suresh you too could um, share this with me in, e in the email afterwards and I'll yeah sure sure uh, get back to you okay so who else is left uh, is if someone is left please go ahead and uh, share If not, what I'd like to do is open it up for broad questions. Uh, anything broadly on writing for, um, uh, including if you want, you know, some suggestions on writing for Indian media, um, uh, on data sources, um, you know, individual data sources on a particular area you're working on, which you had data, you know, just open for any questions now. Yes, Vinay. Uh, Ma'am, um, I was uh, currently currently uh, um, asked to write popular articles on the uh, K phone. Uh, K phone is a kind of a new project which was introduced by uh, Kerala government. Uh, to okay. Give internet to people. So this internet. Is okay. Internet to people. Yeah. So uh, it's like a very new project with very less articles on it, and like I haven't. I mean, I'm a very new, I'm very new to the uh, area of research as well. So I'm finding yeah. it and my, my advisor wants me to bring in more empirics. Uh, although I want to argue from a libertarian point of view, I, I'm, hmm. I, I, I was trying to put forward theoretical uh, arguments against the project. I mean, the policy, because it's, uh, it's against the libertarian values, but um, the, I, I want to bring more data to that. And I, okay. I find it very difficult since it's a very new project. How do we approach in those cases? Sure. So do you need data uh, specifically on the K-Phone, I'm guessing K-Phone project, or do you need on internet usage in general? Um, I mean, I would, I would like to get specific data on K-Phone and like maybe internet usage as such should be also useful, uh, I guess. Okay, so uh, let me take the second first because that's easier. We have two good recent data sources on internet usage. One is from the NFHS itself, uh, the same NFHS. So if you are able to use unit level data or ask someone to help you out with that, you'd be able to get good granular understanding of internet usage in Kerala as recently as 2019 to 21. The other is from the multi-indicator survey NSS 78th round, which also asks about internet usage. And there too, you'd get 1920 uh, data. Again, from the unit level data, you'd get good relevant numbers for Kerala. On K-Phone, so similarly, if there's any scheme that 
one is writing about, you end up having to ask for administrative data from the government agency themselves. So I don't know what the data sharing um, uh, policy there is, but you, you, you know, I, I would imagine that there wouldn't as yet be publicly available data. So what you could do is two things. One is you could say that at least going into the scheme, here is what we know about internet usage in Kerala based on these two big national surveys. And then you'd be able to say, uh, if you were able to get access to some amount of administrative data from the government, you could say something about the K-phone. Uh, does that help? Yes, ma'am. So like to what extent is this uh, empirics relevant in a popular article? Uh, a semi-academic kind of a popular article or, or, or like to what extent can we bring in data um do you think how relevant do you think it is uh, i just want... yeah so if you i i don't think that's what you're doing but if you were to write an article or if you were trying to write an article arguing for the scheme for example it would be extremely useful to look at the current state of internet usage and if you found that there are some districts in kerala or there are some particular social groups or women or the elderly who don't have phones right now and then you if you were able to say that a scheme like this will help or if you if that is what your mandate is if you were able to say if the scheme was designed in this particular way it would help uh, in that way, I feel I think empirics would be uh, very useful. So one of the things that we found in the unit level data uh, for phone usage is the huge, uh, meaning much more than uh, anticipated gender gap in exclusive phone usage. So women who do have access to a phone are much more likely to have a shared or household phone. So if you were trying to say something about, you know, uh, um, having SIM cards in the woman's name or, you know, I don't want to uh, presume what the argument here is, but uh, in that respect, I do think empirics would be important for scheme designing, but I, I'm not sure if that necessarily fits in with what you're trying to argue. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I, actually, I mean, it gave me a perspective to like, look at the, what, what is available. Okay. And thank you so much. Okay. Okay. No problem. Any, anyone else? Similarly, if there's something specific that you're working on, um, I'd be happy to help. There was someone who had a question on out-of-pocket expenditure. I don't know if they're still Kavita, there. Kavita. Kavita had a question. Kavita, was it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so just because yeah, I recently... Actually... Yeah, I just recently came about it, so I'll just quickly mention it. Uh, the main source of out-of-pocket expenditure comes from the... Uh, NSS round, which is called Social Consumption of Health, which was last done in 2017-18. However, there is a nice, I mean, a basic new update. The, um, the uh, Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation is uh, has to produce these regular updates for the uh, Sustainable Development Goal Framework. So currently on the MOSPI website, there's a bunch of reports that are on um, uh, uh, SDG framework uh, data updates. And one of them is on out-of-pocket expenditure. So it gives you state-wise share of uh, household consumption expenditure that is on um, health. Uh, in 1718 versus 20 to 23, which is, you know, shockingly recent for government data. Unfortunately, there's no unit level data available and nothing further beyond <coughs> state level, but that in itself is, is a good start. So that's one. The other is, you know, depending on what your views are on using uh, CMI data, the CPHS has data on um, uh, health expenditure, which you might uh, consider using. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rohit, I saw yours, your hand first. Hi, hi, Rukmi. Sorry, I couldn't share my feedback. So this is what I've been roughly working as well is, you know, there's been a recent debate on like, you know, data quality that's coming in from like the NFHs. And particularly, I think attention has been focused on, say, anemia and I think even uh, stunting rates because you see like, which is what I was trying to look at is even at the very high level of you know, the sort of richest 20%, you still see quite high levels of stunting or anemia. And the important, the discussion quite a very quickly wears into, oh, the data is not collected very well, you know, there's problems with the data and so on. 
So I have two related questions. One, we've been working, trying to like, you know, push back against this and like, you know, have pushed for, you know, sustained data collection in a way which we kind of understand the, but also acknowledge that the limitations with like, you know, capillary blood action is the way you have feasibility requirements so on. So one question is, you know, at one level you have like, you know, constant stream of pets that's coming in every day and that's influencing public opinion on a very level. Whereas like, you know, on the academic side, we try to like, you know, consolidate all the arguments and maybe like write something maybe six months down the line by which time, you know, a lot of, so how do you balance this kind of, you know, constraint? Like, yep. do we get all the answers and then, you know, write a published like paper or like, you know, working paper and then get it translated into like some newspaper article or do we rush to like, you know, rebut all these arguments with what? Two is a lot of the arguments at least that I've seen so far on this kind of stream of thoughts is to pick up another survey or like, you know, adjust for another uh, factor, say like, like a collider or a confounder and then say that, okay, because this shows us lower rates than what the NFH is or NSS does, that is somehow better. And it seems yeah. to me, at least in layperson conversations, much harder to explain to people, okay, you can't, it will give you lower rates, but like there's something called as collider bias. There is something called as like, you know, confirmation bias in this way or that way. So how do yeah. you put that across in your arguments whenever you write for a lay audience? Yeah. 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 Great questions and very, you know, relevant to, sorry, very relevant to all that's going on right now. So. Uh, in terms of this point about, and I think in particular for uh, this anemia stunting, set it off in my mind. Let's let's try and think of it as two things. One is how do you uh, combat this, and uh, you know how much energy and resources. I mean, I think of poor uh, genres. Every time Sujit Bhalla writes something, is he you know going to have to put, <laughs> work on a rebuttal he's got better things to do than write for the Indian Express every week so I, I can I can see how that must be frustrating uh, and I can't say that I know how to how best to allocate resources uh, it is a, you know it is a war for minds that is being fought and there is reason to worry that if you don't put out something that you're sort of you know you see the space. So I don't have a good answer for how to uh, allocate resources. But I will say that, and I, you know, I really take the point that you made about um, measurement of anemia. I think one thing that I would want people to guard against is that when it reaches this point where you feel that there's this onslaught and you're having to push back against it all the time, let's not let that mean that we stop accepting any criticism at all of um, you know surveys and data so i did feel that a little bit again in this uh, recent population estimate stuff i mean of course the the argument needed pushback against but any of us who who, who look at nss uh, are always left with this uh, that there are percentages produced should i use the nss population as the denominator should i use the census projections because they are so different and I don't think that this means, uh, you know, has huge normative uh, implications, but I do think that it's worth engaging with what's going on. Why are these different sort of questions? So I actually think this is related because if we leave the criticism of, of these indicators to, to the loudest voices only, then it, that in, then it means that all the pushback is only going to come in one direction and then everybody else is left in permanent defensive position. While that shouldn't be it. We, we should all be engaging with uh, discussions and criticisms even where warranted of NSS and other data sources. So I don't think I'm helping in any way. I'm just adding more, more things to do. But I would say that I fear this, uh, bes uh, you know, what is it called? Besieged sort of mentality, this bunker mentality that we're all having to get into, where we feel that there's so much propaganda coming that we're having to push back against it all the time. And it means that it's not allowing us to engage with criticisms of uh, of some of this data, even where warranted. So I don't think I'm helping, but uh, that's just my thoughts on that. On the confounder collider one, yeah, I do see that that's hard to deal with, but um, 
there is no way beyond engaging with the specifics of that survey and what's good or bad about it. So if we want to do very distant hand waving about two surveys say this and however this survey says that, no, nobody's going to get very far. So you're going to have to get into the weeds of how it was collected and the implications of that and whether that means it can be used to say one thing or the other. Um, I do think it, it makes for a less breezy reading experience for the general public. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's no way beyond getting into the weeds of it. it. It really cannot be, look at these two surveys and not that one because I said so, right? We're going to have to engage with how good or, or bad that other uh, source of data is. And I think uh, uh, one thing we can all do is that we can talk about, well, uh, let's all discuss the surveys, but let's at least have some broad consensus on the standards, because I think even that is under attack now, right? Like whether the standards of Strante and EMEA are um, applicable to India. So that sort of Indian exceptionalism stuff, that is really, that I mean, we can push back against without um, having to think about all the other things we have to do at the same time. So yeah, I don't think, I don't think I'm helping by uh, helping to rationally allocate resources. But this is just my broad idea that let's also engage with the criticism and let's not get into bunker mentality, even though it might feel like we're being forced there. Um, I'm going to take Shravan's question as the last question. Go ahead, Shravan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, when we are checking this uh, domestic violence question, I mean, post-2005 from NFHS, like the woman reporting like, uh, if if I neglected all the extreme question, like very extreme violence question, but very base, I mean, if I can say that, have they ever experienced less severe violence? So in mm. particular, taking that question and taking uh, summary stats, uh, we can see that a lot of women are reporting, no, around 90% of the women are reporting, they haven't experienced the violence. And for almost like 15 years, that is almost same mm. figure. So the norms are very sticky. And in the reality, it's not the correct fact what we we are trying to uh, i mean see through reports and everything so how far we can okay. do the credibility to the nfhs data if somebody is doing any causal uh, regression analysis on violent norms and labor market or any kind of that stuff okay unfortunately this is not something i've looked be. at uh, sorry this is not something i've looked at in detail so i won't be able to tell you specifically on this I have one broad point, though, which is that I do think that states need to do a better job of um, working on NFHS data. So I know from having seen some work that's going on in Tamil Nadu, for example, there there were substantial concerns in Tamil Nadu about the N uh, NFHS 5 data, not in a it's making us look good, in a making us look bad way. It really was economists and statisticians who felt that some things were not making sense, some things were overtly rosy from what they knew, and especially in like a pandemic time survey. So I do think that state governments are in a good position to be doing some relevant things themselves. Many of them have large surveys that they've conducted at the same time for some other purpose, which allows them to do some checks. Or they have things like, like what they did in Tamil Nadu is that uh, there was some check about uh, some numbers had gone up about uh, uh, on sanitation, but simultaneously they found that, you know, some scheme that they had been rolling out only so, so and so number had taken it up. So it just made the NFHS numbers seem uh, inexplicable. So I do, I, on the whole, I don't have, I don't feel like mass uh, panic about the NFHS, but I do think that states now need to be taking up the state sample and doing a little bit of work on it to figure out uh, what's going on. Unfortunately, on this domestic violence thing, I have not looked at these two categories separately, the less severe, more severe one, so I'm not able to, um, off the top of my mind, suggest anything to you. Um, I, I've put my email address in the chat, and if you have, any of you have two things, either specific questions on data sources that you think I might have ideas on, or uh, specific things that you are interested in writing that you'd like some feedback on, I'd be happy to do it. Sometimes it takes me a few days, but I will uh, eventually get back to it. If in your email, you could just mention that you were part of this workshop, uh, that will help. Uh, that's all from me, Japanese.
Okay, so that that has already answered Navin's question actually. So he has recently published a paper and he's planning to write some op-eds, uh, and uh, he would love your feedback on it. Uh, so absolutely, he can reach, he can reach out over the email. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, this was an in insightful. If, um, using the knowledge that we have gained today, uh, people here will write a lot of pieces and uh, uh, you know some produce some good articles. And I hope you get to read it somewhere or the other. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, and if you have any questions, as Rukmini said, uh, feel, feel free to reach out over the email. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks Bye. everyone. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Rukmini. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.